So Service Mesh, uh, my name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. Um, like, like he said, I, I come from San Francisco, California. And today we're going to be talking about Service Mesh. The transition and adoption of Service Mesh fits into the big picture of modernization that our organizations are going through. I like to say that enterprise organizations are becoming very complex organisms, multicellular organisms. We are becoming decoupled, distributed, both our software and our teams. Our teams, in fact, are getting also as decoupled and as distributed as our software. You know, the journey to modernization and the journey to service mesh, it's not just a journey about a technical and technological adoption. It's a journey that goes on three different tracks. One of them being the technical aspects, so technology adoption. The second one being the organizational transition, how the organization has to change to support a new microservice-oriented architecture. As well as operational, the things we were doing with the monolith have to change. We cannot deploy, scale, version, and document the, the, uh, a microservice-oriented architecture the same way we used to do with the monolith. It has to be different. So three different tracks that are changing how we build software. This is a revolution, really, uh, that has started in 2013 and in 2014 when Docker was released, when Kubernetes in 2014 was released. And Docker and Kubernetes gave access to this new trend, a new trend of creating applications in a different way, but in a better way, in a way that allows us to scale them over time, not just from a technical standpoint, but also as a way to scale our business first and foremost. And in fact, although this is going to be a technical track, I am going to be talking about the business goals we're trying to achieve often during this presentation. Because no technical transition, no journey can be adopted without reconciling the technical adoption, the technological adoption we're making with the actual business goals. We have to be very pragmatic across our journey. And this is a journey, it's a journey that goes from monolith to services, to microservices and service mesh, as well as pockets of adoption of a, perhaps serverless and function as a service. And who knows what's going to be happening next. In this journey, APIs are shifting and changing their role within our systems. APIs and API management in general used to be something at the edge when you know, mobile comes out in 2007, 2008, we need a way to communicate with our monolithic applications. And so we have north-south traffic, primarily API traffic, which gives access to our monolith from an external developer, an external mobile app, external partners. But then as we decouple our software more and more, APIs assume a more important role within our systems so-called east-west traffic. East-west traffic that happens across different teams, different products of our systems, as well as as we, as we keep optimizing and scaling our systems, service mesh uh, with the separation of data planes and control planes, which we're going to be exploring today. But so, adopting service mesh, transitioning to microservices, let's take a step back. What does it mean from a pragmatic standpoint? Refactoring a monolith is an activity that unlocks team productivity and business scalability. The key words here for this transition is team productivity and business scalability. If in our transition, in our journey to microservices, we do not achieve at least one of those, then the transformation we're doing, it's an academic project. It's not a real pragmatic project. And if it's an academic project, we have to ask ourselves, do we have to do it in the first place? The business should always be the driver to this transformation. Because the business goals, the key results we want to achieve, determine the strategy and the execution we're going to adopt in microservices. And they're going to be determining when to begin, but also, more importantly, when to stop. And so, 
the second question that I would like to ask, and I usually ask to anybody who's embarking into this transition, into this journey, is, so should we do it? Should we move to microservices? Should we transition away from what we have today? There's lots of hype you know, in the technologies and in the te technology landscape. We have to ask ourselves, this is the Gartner hype cycle, right? We have to ask ourselves, are we doing it because of hype or are we doing it because we have a pragmatic reason to be doing so? Transitioning to microservices, it's more complex than running monoliths. It's not easier and it's not an easier journey. It's harder because we move from O of 1 to O of N systems. We don't have a few large monoliths anymore that we deploy the same way, that we scale the same way, but we're going to be having more and more systems. It, it's almost as moving from having 10 monoliths or one monolith to hundreds, thousands of different monoliths, right? And so if we do have a problem managing the monoliths today, well, microservices are not going to be fixing that problem. In fact, they're going to be making it worse. So the organization has to be mature enough, the team has to be mature enough to be able to, to know that they can do it. And in fact, I really recommend a step-to-step -step approach in the transition, in the journey to microservices for a couple of reasons. Number one, by doing it step by step, the team gets confidence that they can do it. And we can adapt and change our processes as we are onboarding into this journey. And the second step is that the business leadership, which has to be on board with this transition, also will get more confident that this transition is the right thing to do to scale and modernize the business over time. In fact, when we look at microservices and we look at companies like Netflix, like Amazon, companies that have transitioned to microservices a long time ago, even before Kubernetes, even before Docker, what was the driver for these organizations? Netflix had to move from a place where the business was selling, uh, was offering their uh, platform in one country on one client, and they had to move to a place where they, were, they wanted to expand into multiple countries and multiple clients. So that was the business goal, and the architecture they had before was not right for the goal the business was aiming for. And so they moved to microservices as an answer to that business goal. Same as Amazon. Amazon wanted to move from selling one thing to selling pretty much everything. And so the architecture had to change as an answer to that more complex demand. So microservices have to be tied to those business goals. And to do so, we cannot work in a silo. Both the engineering team and the leadership has to be on board. In fact, when we look at one of the most successful examples of microservices, when we look at Amazon, who said in Amazon that the company should move to microservices? The CEO, Jeff Bezos. He wrote a letter, if you don't use an API, moving on, moving forward, you're fired. It didn't start from the engineering team, it started from the CEO. The business leadership has to be on board. So doing it step by step allows the business leadership to get more confidence this is the right way moving forward. From O of 1 to O of N, we're going to be moving across significant um, complexity in order to be able to achieve our goals. Now it's up to us to determine when that complexity stops and how big or how small the microservices should be. In fact, they should be as big or how small as the business requires. No more, no less than that. But if we decide that microservices is what we need, if we think that this is going to be the right way moving forward, then only then let's move forward with the transition. There are three different strategies that I've identified when transitioning to microservices. One of them I call the ice cream scoop strategy. So you have a large box of ice cream and you scoop out from this monolith, the, the large box of ice cream, you scoop out individual services and business logic that now can be executed and deployed separately in a different process. Then there is the legal strategy, which means that you are never going to get rid fully of the monolith, which is something that most likely, especially for very old monoliths, is going to happen but new functionality will be built 
in a new different architecture. And so you have to find a way to reconnect this new greenfield microservice application with the legacy brownfield applications that you are already running today that are very hard to transition away. And then there is the third strategy, which I call the nuclear strategy, um, which basically means we are going to be creating everything from scratch in a microservice rented architecture. Um, we're going to be maintaining the monolith during the transition, and everything from day one will, you know, will start this new journey into microservices. In my opinion, never go nuclear, because that's the worst option. It requires lots, um, a very good, strong technical team, but also very strong technical boundaries into determining when to stop. And when, uh, you know, you end up in the situation where you have two different teams working in parallel, and one is a maintenance team, the other one is doing the refactoring. Because moving to microservices is a refactoring. It's no more, no less than that. So as we are refactoring this new code base, um, the old code base into the new code base, uh, then you know, the question is, where do we build new features? And the business doesn't run on the new one, still runs on the old one. So you end up with this very complicated situation. So in my opinion, never go nuclear. Uh, today we're going to be exploring the ice cream scoop strategy instead. So let's take a monolith, for example. You know, in a monolith, in an object-oriented monolith, we have all of our functions, all of our features, represented in the form of different objects, different classes, that are communicating with each other within the scope of the monolith. Perhaps we have a database. We share the database with all of these different objects. And if you want to scale this monolith, we just deploy more and more instances of this big box. Simple as that. So for example, if the monolith is a marketplace. So think of, of something like Amazon.com. In the monolith, we're going to be having different objects. We're going to be having user management, orders management. We have uh, an inventory. We can search the inventory, and so on and so forth. Right? So this is an example of a monolith with all of the separate parts, the domain logic in, uh, uh, represented in these boxes. And because this is, going, this is a large monolith, we're going to be having more than one team, more than one team working on it. We're going to be having, in this example, three different teams that are contributing to the monolith, creating new features for the monolith, and then putting them in production. Now, of course, uh, you know, monol monolithic applications and microservices applications have a few pros and cons. But one of the, one of the uh, problems with monoliths is that if one team starts making very frequent changes, then there needs to be lots of coordination among the other teams to deploy these changes in production, right? And as the code base becomes bigger, as the, pro the team becomes also bigger, this becomes more problematic over time. It basically allows us, it makes us lose efficiency when creating new, new release cycles with a monolith. So team two starts making frequent changes. So what do we do in a very pragmatic way? Because Team 2 was working on the search, on the inventory part, and so on, and that part requires very, lots of changes, how about we extract that away? So scoop strategy, we extract some domain logic away from the monolith, and we put it somewhere else. This, it's still a pretty big, significant service. It's not a microservice, but this is what the business requires today, and this is what we're going to be doing today. And so we extract that away, and we also make sure that the new service we're extracting does not depend on the same database as the old monolith, as the old code base. The reason for that is that we want the services to be independent. So if the old monolith starts making too many requests to the database in such a way that the database becomes unavailable, well, we don't want that service to be affected. We want to have separation and isolation of concerns. And then, we run in production like this for a while, and then what we figure out is that there is some parts of that that also requires too many changes. And so over time, we extract that away, uh, again. And so now we have three different services, one being our old monolith, one being a larger service, a service, and one being an even smaller service. In a very pragmatic way, 
every time we do these changes, every time we extract away from the monolith or we extract away or we make our services smaller, we're doing it as an answer to a problem that we're facing today. And as we're doing it step by step, we're also fixing, uh, improving the agility of the business, right? In a very pragmatic way, again, we're not going through this journey all at once. Doing it step by step, again, allows us to change the other things that have to change in the organization and in the operations of our systems in order to be able to support even more decoupling moving forward. In fact, approaching the transition, really what it really is, is a refactoring. And like any other refactoring you're doing, even within the monolith, even within the code base, we have to have a few things in place. Well, number one, we need to understand what the monolith does. If we don't understand what the code does, it's very hard for us to be able to draw those boundaries. You know, most monoliths are too entangled. Uh, have the domain logic within the monolith, it's too entangled and too spaghetti. And so we need to understand what the boundaries are in order for us to decouple them. If we don't know what the boundaries are, then we have a problem. We, don't, we cannot possibly extract it. Then in order to be able um, to refactor the monolith, we also have to understand what are the clients that are using the monolith today and uh, what is the impact we're going, to be, we're going to be creating with these clients if things don't go right, don't go well. And so understanding who can be impacted is also another step among the steps we have to do to understand, uh, to start this journey. And then the third thing that we need to do is that, like every other refactoring, we cannot really be successful with it if we don't have a test tests in place, integration tests in place, in order to validate that the behavior that we are changing, the, the behavior that's now being executed by the monolith is not going to be affected by this refactoring. We want to change how we scale our systems and how our systems internally are working. We do not want to disrupt the clients necessarily, or at least we don't want to do both at the same time, but step by step. Among the things that we have to put in place is um, a few, uh, a few uh, functions that we didn't necessarily have at the same scale when running the monolith. For example, updating our clients uh, or updating the routing in order to be able to route requests to different services. The clients are making requests to our monolith, but now those requests are not going to be, pro be processed by the monolith anymore, are going to be processed by another service. So how do we reroute those requests? Um, you know, in the monolith, traditionally, we have a load balancer. So the load balancer sits in front of our north-south traffic um, um, from, for example, a client like the front end, can be a mobile application. And so when we deploy the monolith, we just put more instances behind a load balancer. But now that we are decoupling that monolith, we need to have something that's smarter. So one of the things we could adopt is, uh, for example, a very fast and quick API gateway. API gateways, think of them as very smart load balancers. They do load balancing among other things. So that when we decouple away those services, we can now implement routing functions that allow us, it's a north-south, the API gateway is a north-south proxy, that's where it is that allows us to reroute requests across these different services without disrupting the clients. That's very important. If we disrupt the clients, then we're causing harm to the business instead of creating an advantage to the business. This north-south proxy, the gateway, also has to be smart enough to be able to help us with the operations of our architecture. Like I said, Transitioning to microservices, it's not just technology adoption, let's say containers, Kubernetes, but it's also operational transition. We cannot deploy a microservice-oriented architecture or a service-oriented architecture the same way as a monolith. We need to implement some strategies which allow us to reduce the risk. So for example, when a new version of a service is being released, like version 1.1, from 1.0 to 1.1, for example, we implement canary releases, which reroute 10% of the traffic to the new version, and only if that works, we can increase the 
all the way up to 100%, and then perhaps at that point, get rid of the old version. We're going to keep the old version running just in case we need to roll back to the working previous version. As before I go deeper into microservices and service mesh, I would also like to spend just a, a minute speaking about hybrid platforms and multi-cloud. You see, when transitioning to microservices and perhaps adopting modern platforms like Kubernetes for running our services, chances are that we're not going to be running everything in Kubernetes. Because guess what? The monolith still runs. We still have the monolith running into whatever platform we were using before, like virtual machines, for example. When we plan the transition to microservices, we have to reconnect, we have to have a strategy in place to reconnect with the current application that's running on legacy platforms. We cannot make the assumption that overnight everything is going to be running in Kubernetes. So how do we reconnect the new greenfield running on Kubernetes with the dependencies that are still running on virtual machines, for example? Now, when we think of an organization as a complex organism, like I said before, we're thinking of different teams, different products, different business goals that all together are being pursued independently by each one of these units. The organization from a higher level standpoint doesn't become hybrid or doesn't become multi-cloud necessarily because there is a top-down decision to do so. It becomes hybrid and multi-cloud because inevitably these different teams over time have chosen different platforms, these different teams have chosen different Clouds, perhaps the organization has acquired some companies that are running on a different cloud. And over time, the organization, from a higher level standpoint, does become hybrid, not because it wants to, but because it has to. So the systems, in an ideal world, we have everything running in one place. But that's not the pragmatic scenario. The pragmatic scenario is that we're going to be having systems running everywhere. So we need to have especially as a higher level architects, we have to have tools in place to be able to handle with a multi-cloud and hybrid world within the organization. As we extract our services more and more from the monoliths, it's very important, in my opinion, and this is when I've seen very successful transitions, it's very important to size the services the right way for the current goal, right? Like in my prior example, we didn't go all the way to microservices. We extracted a quite large service, and then over time, we decoupled it more and more. We made it smaller over time. The reality is that uh, in an ideal world, when we look at service meshes and microservice architectures, we look at these uh, you know, ideal world of services that are all small, all micro, all connected to each other the same way. But the reality is that these services are going to be having different sizes depending on what are the business goals we're trying to achieve, and which is perfectly fine, by the way. We should not pursue and chase an ideal world of microservices if what we need is not micro, but perhaps it's macro. <laughs> All right, so we are decoupling our services. We have now different services in place. They are decoupled. Different teams can build them independently. They can deploy them independently. But most importantly, these are services that don't live in a, in, a, in a silo. They have to communicate with each other. So we end up in a situation where in a monolithic applications, we basically have objects. We have interfaces in our code, in our code and we have function calls. And by pretty much executing those function calls, we can invoke and access different objects in our code base. But as we decouple them into microservices, those objects become services. And the interface is still there, but we're going to be accessed it via a network call. In a monolith, for example, a Java monolith, when we make a function call, we have blind trust that that function call the actual invocation of a function call will be processed successfully by, for example, the underlying Java virtual machine. Right? The Java virtual machine will receive the invocation and will route that function invocation to whatever object we're consuming. Well, but with microservices, we cannot make that assumption anymore because now we're going over a network. 
So we have no guarantee that the network request we're making that substitutes the functional request will actually reach its destination. That is a big assumption. The network is a very unreliable component that we're adding in our system. Because the network, as we all know, the network can be slow, the network can have latency, the network can be down, the network can have a million problems that now, unlike the monolith, are going to be affecting our system. In a, a microservice-oriented architecture, also, we're going to be having different teams running and deploying these services. And the mindset of the team has to change. In a monolith, there are two states. Either the monolith works or it doesn't. But in, micro, in microservices, there is always going to be a service that has problems. So the mindset has to change to the mindset of basically having a partially degraded architecture at any given time. Because there is always going to be a problem in each one of these different services. The more we create, the more teams are able to deploy them independently from each other. So this is a mindset change that also in the organization, in, in the culture of our engineering team, we have to adopt. We have to know how to deal with a partially degraded system at any given time and still offer a very good experience to the end user. We're doing all of this for the end user. We're not doing this for us. We're doing this to, at the end of the day, deliver a better product to the end user. So latency. Latency cannot be ignored anymore. It compounds over time. You know, network latency becomes more important, even more so than traditional north-south traffic that was going from the mobile app to our monolith. You know, from a mobile app to a monolith, if we have 100 milliseconds of latency, you know, it's not ideal. We can work around that. We can put a CDN, you know, we can make it faster and so on. We can cache it. In microservices, latency compounds over time because the requests we're making are going to be more and more intense across each one of these different services. Service A, consuming service B, consuming service C, all the way back, it compounds over time. And in a microservice rented architecture, having a slow architecture is the new down. Slow is the new down in microservices. In a monolith, when the app is down, it's down, all right? In microservices, when it's slow, it's down. Because you're affecting the end user almost as if the entire system didn't, doesn't work anymore. So latency becomes a first class problem we have to fix. It's not something we can fix later. It's like security. Performance cannot be a feature. You cannot add it later. You cannot add security later. You have to build your system with this in mind, with performance in mind. Likewise, we build our systems with security in mind. But security as well becomes another component of this. So now that we have all of these communications on the network, we want to be able to encrypt and protect this traffic by, for example, being able to enforce mutual TLS or you know, encrypting this traffic across each one of these different services. By, by the way, these services may not run necessarily on RESTful APIs anymore. We're going to be using whatever transport is better for our use case. So it might be REST, might be gRPC, or might be anything else that can talk on the wire. So we're not limited to one specific transport, one specific protocol as well. And so how do we protect and secure all of this communication transparently? As well as routing, like I mentioned before. Now that we have different services, how do we put in place a system that can route to different versions of our service, to different deployments of our service, from one cloud to another even, perhaps? As well as error handling. If there are instances of our services that are not running anymore, we want to be able to interrupt traffic to that broken instance, to that broken replica of our instance, of our service. So we need to have circuit breakers in place, health checks in place, and this is not something that we didn't have to have with monoliths. We still did, but here they become critical. Now this is a bigger scale. It's like running a thousand monoliths. We have to have this in place since day one, or we're going to be failing with our journey, with our transition. As well as observability. It's not like before we didn't want to know what requests were going through. The difference is that now we absolutely want to know them. 
because we need to be able to identify what's the weak link across our microservice center architecture. So how do we trace all the requests going from one service to another? How do we collect performance metrics? And how do we also collect logs so that we can understand at any given time where the micro, what the microservices are doing and where the problem is if there is a problem? It's very hard to transition to microservices without having this in place because inevitably something will go wrong at one point and we will not have the right instrumentation in place to be able to dig down and find where the problem is. So let's talk about service mesh. The service mesh pattern, so first of all, service mesh is not a technology, it's a pattern. We can implement service mesh in many, many different ways. But basically, we're going to be having a proxy running alongside our services, and these proxies will have the job of making the network, which is unreliable, reliable. The idea here is that we're going to be building our services, not worrying about how we're going to be taking care of latency, how we're going to be taking care of observability, how we're going to be taking care of mutual TLS and so on, because the contact points are not the service to services anymore, are the data planes to data planes. So the contact points, what goes over the outside network, is going to be the communication between the data planes. Those are the contact points. And because of that, the data planes can enforce logic that the service is unaware of so that we can deal with that error handling, deal with that latency, deal with that observability in place. In a service mesh, the data plane is both a proxy and a reverse proxy, depending where the request is going. For example, if this service wants to consume this service, this data plane will be a proxy because the request the service is making will be proxied through this data plane. But when that data plane receives the request, that data plane will act as a reverse proxy. It will receive the request and then proxy it to the service that's being associated with. We're going to be having a data plane. Well, there are different ways of implementing service meshes. Uh, we can have one data plane per underlying virtual machine, or we can have one data plane for each replica of each service that we're running. The latter be, being called a sidecar, a sidecar proxy, because we're going to be having one instance of that data plane for each instance of, the of, uh, of our services. But the idea is the same. It does not matter if we have one data plane per replica or we have one data plane per underlying virtual machine. The idea is that every time there is going to be a service-to-service -service communication, that communication will go through a data plane first and it will be received by a data plane later. The services are not talking to each other in, directly anymore. They have to go through this different system. Which allows us to implement additional logic in the data planes that the services are not aware of. Which is great, because then all the mutual TLS enforcement, all the observability comes out of the box without the teams having to build that in the service. As you can see, the data planes are going to be the touch point, the contact point for anything that we are consuming within our systems, including the databases. Because when a service consumes a database, we we'll still want to have that observability. We we'll still want to have all the features that the data plane provides. Everything will talk to everything else via a data plane. So we have lots of network calls across different services through a decentralized proxy. It's called decentralized because unlike traditional ESBs, we don't have a centralized instance of our proxy that everything goes through, but it's decentralized. Each service has its own. So you ever heard, like I said, uh, sidecar proxy, and you know, we might be familiar with what that is, but just to go back to the definition, um, in Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes abstracts away how we are deploying our pods in the underlying virtual machine. So we can take a bunch of virtual machines and Kubernetes makes it look like one computer, basically. Kubernetes will decide where those pods go. When we tell Kubernetes, I want this proxy to be a sidecar container 
for this other pod, for this specific container, what you're telling Kubernetes is that I want to make extra sure that the proxy will be deployed on the underlying virtual machine where we are deploying the, the service. We want the sidecar proxy to always be deployed on the underlying virtual machine because we want the communication between the service and the proxy to always be on local host, right, for each one of these replicas. The assumption is that because it's in local host, the success rate will always be 100% because we're not going outside on the outside network. We're always in the virtual machine. And the problematic network, which is between here and there, well, that will be taken care of by the, da by the data plane. And we're going to be having one instance of that proxy if you use the sidecar model for each instance of our service. Well, now this adds a problematic uh, for the data plane, that data plane really has to be small when it comes to resource utilization and has to be very small when it comes to footprint because we're going to be having one of those running for each replica of each service in our system, which means that if the proxy itself consumes lots of resources, we're going to be running out of resources of memory, for example, in the underlying virtual machine. So the more, if we adopt the sidecar proxy, we have to make sure that that is a very small, very small proxy with a small footprint. And by the way, this is the same concern we have with our own services. Likewise, our services cannot take too much memory. Otherwise, either we're running very large virtual machines or we're going to be running out of memory very soon. So the services and the proxies, they both have to be very small when it comes to resource utilization. That's why you cannot put an ESB there. Can you imagine running an instance of an ESB for each instance of your services? It does not work. Now, of course, we're going to be having all these different data planes running across these different services. But then sooner than later, we want to be able to send some configuration to these data planes. And because these data planes come and go, depending, of our ser depending when our services come and go, it's very hard to communicate to them as a whole. Like, we don't want, we need to have something that allows us to push the configuration to these different data planes. And that something, it's the control plane. This is a, you know, data plane and control planes are something that are very, were very popular in the networking space. You have a bunch of Cisco switches running in your data center, and you want to be pushing your configuration to these Cisco switches. You, know, you want to have a control plane that allows you to do that. Same concept applied to software. We have a control plane which allows us to push the configuration, basically, into each one of these data planes or it allows the data plane to retrieve this, in, this configuration from a centralized place. But also, it becomes a way for us to collect the metrics. Now that the data planes are collecting all this traffic at runtime, we want to have a component which allows us to collect the logs, collect the metrics, and that can still be the control plane. The data plane, it's on the execution path of our requests. The control plane is not. The control plane it's only for configuration. It's only for retrieving those metrics. But the control plane, it's never on the execution path of our API requests. And basically, our north-south gateway just becomes another data plane. It's another proxy. It's another data plane which allows us to communicate with the underlying data planes. Now, because they're all part of the same mesh, we can enforce mutual TLS across each one of these different data planes, ensuring that our system is being protected. Without service mesh, we can still do this, but we have to build it in our services. So service mesh is not required to run microservices. Technically, it's not. But if you want to have all these benefits, then we have to build them ourselves. That's the problem. And and service mesh also does not require Kubernetes. The concept of service mesh can be applied to any platform. It's just that Kubernetes makes it easier for us to run microservices at a large scale, but nothing prevents us from running service mesh across virtual machines. As long as we deploy an instance of our data plane in the same virtual machine where the service is running, effectively we have a service mesh running on virtual machines. In fact, we most likely want to have that. We want to have a service mesh that can run in Kubernetes, 
if you want to use Kubernetes, for example. But because, like I said before, we, we're still going to be having our monolith running in a virtual machine in a legacy platform, we also want the monolith to join this mesh somehow. So we want it to be running the data plane, not just on Kubernetes, but also wherever our monolith is running. Because we want that monolith to be part of the same mesh as well. So being platform agnostic, it's very important if you want to move pragmatically into microservices. Like I said, different services can now be built in different languages. And it does not matter because we can, well, that's one of the benefits of microservices, we can deploy them, we can build them independently, deploy them independently, and the functionality that we're building, it's into the data plane, which means we do not have to replicate the same logic over and over again into different technologies. The data plane, it's an uh, out of process proxy that runs alongside the process of the service in the same underlying virtual machine. I would like to spend a word about event-based architectures. Um, when we talk about service mesh uh, and when we talk about microservices, we usually talk about service to service communication, but that's not the only way of implementing these sort of systems. Uh, there is another system um, another way of building them, which is um, uh, adopting event-based um, architectures. What that means is that at one point, we are going to be having an event propagating across our architecture, and that is going to be a more effective way to do things like, for example, uh, state propagation. So let's assume that we have two different microservices. We have the orders, we have an order microservice, and we have an invoice microservice. Every time we create an order, we create an invoice. Sounds good. But then what happens if, for whatever reason, the invoice microservice is not available? We can retry again, and then retry again. But eventually, the request will time out, and that invoice will never be created. That shouldn't happen. But if it does happen, we have a state, we have a, a, a disruption to our state propagation within the systems, which is very painful to fix after the fact. So for that, state, for that use case, for state propagation, we might decide to use events and then let the invoice microservice process the event, the order created event, for example, whenever it's ready to do so, so that we don't lose our state. The thing is, the catch is that the event collector we use can be Kafka, for example, but can be really anything else, happens to be just yet another service within our systems. We still want to have a data plane in front of that service because we want to make sure that at least it reaches the uh, collector. So we could adopt Kafka or a, a log collector of some sort for some of our use cases. But then, of course, the catch is that we have to make sure that the log collector is available and that doesn't go down, right? But it's easier, usually, to focus on making, on giving the uptime to one service, like the log collector, rather than being able to give it to every service we're propagating our state to. So because we only have one component, we really have to make sure it's always up and running, as opposed to having all of them up and running we can focus in making that a little bit more reliable. Therefore, making our state propagation more reliable. Like I said, um, enterprise organizations really are moving and our systems are moving to complex organisms. So I really like this analogy with our nervous system. Um, our body is made of two different components. Of the CNS, the central nervous system in our brain, and the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system fills all the information that our body uh, can understand and then delivers them to the CNS so that the CNS can process them. This is very similar to what the concept of a control plane and a data plane is. The data plane will be at the periphery of each one of our services, each one of our monoliths, each one of our functions, for example, lambdas. But the configuration, the monitoring, the observability, all of that will be handled by the control plane. So I said before I'm the um, co-founder in City of Kong. Um, this is what Kong does effectively. We provide an open source control plane and data plane that allows to manage um, different architectures among the journey that organizations are doing. So we work with developers. There are more than a million instances running um, around the world of Kong, of the data plane, and we help organizations transition 
their architectures from a technology standpoint, from monolithic to services to mesh to serverless. All right, so to recap, uh, transitioning to microservices, it's a very complex topic because it impacts three different tracks. But most importantly, we have to reconnect this journey to the business goals that the organization has. Otherwise, like I said, it becomes an academic project. So it's a business transformation, first and foremost. We have, therefore, to adopt a pragmatic strategy. We don't have to go all the way down to micro immediately or to having thousands of, of services immediately if we don't need to. The catch is that there is always time to make a service smaller and smaller over time. So there is no rush into extracting a service into an intermediate size and then over time making it smaller. In fact, I would say that's the best approach because we can make it smaller only when it's required to make it smaller. Because either it increases our productivity or it increases our business output. As well as adopting enabling technology which allows us to, number one, transition to these new architectures, microservices, but also in a very pragmatic way can connect the brownfield legacy applications which are delivering business today, those are still the most critical components, connect them with our new greenfield microservice architecture which is going to be the future of our systems. So there needs to be a connection between the past and the new. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's time for some questions. Like I said, that's still an option. So as long as the organization has the R&D to be able to do that and has the clear goals in mind, that's one of the options we have among the options that are available in the transition to microservices. So it's an option. We have to make our pros and cons into adopting that option. Of course, Amazon made their pros and cons and decided there were more pros into going nuclear, for example, rather than doing the journey by slowly extracting the services from the monolith. It's still an option. In my opinion, very few companies were successful with that option. So, of course, that's something to take into consideration. Well, so the system can give us the metrics to understand where the latency bottlenecks are, right? So we need, we need to, we're going over a network. So the assumption is that we're going to be having more latency than going over function calls. It's inevitable. In fact, the proxy, if not built right, can add even more latency to that network processing because you know, all that mutual TLS, all of that observability also adds latency on top of our processing. Right. So what we, we can do is caching some of that information on the data plane layer so that the request perhaps doesn't go all the way outside of the network. So what I've seen is organizations implementing some sort of global caching across these different services, assuming that that's even possible because for some use cases we cannot implement that. And for others, instead, they have embraced fully the concept of an eventual consistent architecture. So latency is just part of the equation, and the clients 
are, building, are built in such a way that takes that into consideration. So everything is eventual consistent, and that there's going to be some delay, and the information we're going to be seeing on the client, it's not going to necessarily be the most updated one, but it's going to be eventual consistent, right? So the latency consideration, uh, we, Service Mesh can help us in a couple of ways. Can help us by, by identifying where the critical points are. In latency, it's not just the network latency, it's the service latency as well. So we want to be able to have observability in place to also determine if we have to make some updates to a specific service that now becomes the bottleneck to every other service as well as it allows us to perhaps implementing those caching functions which speed up uh, the architecture in certain use cases. But of course, we're going over a network, so we have to be very pragmatic into understanding you know, what the critical latency is and which one is not. And if it's not, let's make the system eventually consistent and let's build the client in such a way that they have that assumption in place. Okay, lunch time. <laughs>